Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Paris Air Show at the historic airfield in Le Bourget outside the French capital. Our sponsors this week are L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And we have with us Dave Phillips, who is the Vice President for Small and Medium Unmanned Aerial Vehicles at Textron Systems. No. Dave, great, great to see you. And also, a little bit of full disclosure, Bell Helicopter, a Textron company, is also one of our, our sponsors. Dave, thanks for taking time out Thank on you. this absolutely freezing day to talk it's to us here in really Paris. Really cold. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a it's a real penetrating cold for anybody who doesn't know. Yes. It's it's about 95 degrees and 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 really hot here on this runway. Um, you guys uh, have had a long tradition of a whole vast array of unmanned uh, aircraft, small and medium. You have a, a new product that you guys have unveiled here at we the do. air show. It doesn't like to see the light. Uh, you you like to keep it in the back. Talk to us a little bit. You know, talk to us about the new product program and how you think it positions you guys in the market. Okay, thank you. Um, we uh, are proud to have unveiled the, the uh, Night Warden today. Uh, it, is a, it is a production uh, model of a system that we've had in development for quite some time and have uh, demonstrated for various customers both internationally and domestic. It really leverages the million hours that we have in our shadow system, so it, it's, it's uh, while it's a new system and, and brings a whole lot of new capabilities, including most notably satellite uh, control, so we can, we can operate the system from, from you know, great distances away and, and increased payload capacity, but it does leverage a lot of the experience that we do have from one million hours in our shadow program. What are some of the features that you guys are bringing to this? The aircraft, uh, you know, looks a little shadow-like, tail configuration, a couple of other things, but you've got winglets that are going on, you have a blended sort of body. What are some of the features that are in this uh, aircraft that are not in some of the other ones you guys have, have been building? So the, the, the biggest is the fact that it has enough payload capacity and power, or size, weight, and power swap, to, to include a satellite dish inside the fuselage of the aircraft. It enables us to meet some of the emerging missions of our customers now, which is primarily to, to go great distances, way out of data link range, and, and, and have eyes on a target and then return, and to do that from a very safe distance. But it, it also maintains a very small footprint. So many of our customers want all this additional capability, but they want a small footprint. They don't want a big group four. They want a group three sized system, and the manpower the reductions that it takes to operate a much smaller system, but to have the capabilities that you see inherent in much larger systems. And have you made any trade-off? What kind of endurance uh, are you talking about with sort of your standard reconnaissance payload? So with just the reconnaissance payload, we can take the payload bay that, that houses the satellite communications and we can fill that full of fuel. So you can really extend the mission times well beyond if you're flying just satellite. And if you're flying satellite, we can still get a significant uh, um, endurance, somewhere in the order of 12 to 15 hours. And uh, are you, uh, weaponization is something that you've been taking on a, a lot of your vehicles. You have the Fury, very innovative, very small precision munition. Uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that, even though that's not totally your bailiwick. But what are the sort of weapon fit that you're looking at, at, at putting on the new product? Well, we have integrated, as you said, our, our weapon systems on it. We, uh, we, we primarily like to say that, that, that many of our systems are agnostic. We put hard points on them. We enable them to carry certain amounts of, of payload by weight. And then we let our customer try to determine what packages what kinds of payloads that they want to put onto the aircraft. I want to ask you about a couple of other aircraft that are in the portfolio. Right, right next to us, you've got vertical takeoff and landing yes. uh, aircraft. Um, that's increasingly in demand, especially for uh, bare base remote areas that, that are such that, you know, even, even something that's very, very durable has a hard time landing. Talk to us what you're doing on, on that part of the space, which um, you know is becoming a challenging market, especially when some of these commercial products are starting to get there in endurance and in size and in complexity that normally would be associated with a military aircraft. You're right. And the, the vertical takeoff off and uh, lift uh, Aerosan system really does leverage 200,000 hours now in just the last three years alone of experience that we've gotten with the Aerosan system. The Aerosan system is a very capable group two, has about an 80 pound gross takeoff weight, but yet still carries 20 pounds of payload. 
we're doing missions for United States Special Operations Command, United States Air Force, United States Army, uh, United States Marine Corps, all in a contractor-owned, contractor-operated environment. Those customers, specifically the special operations community, has wanted us to get even smaller. There's runway independence, but then there's runway independence that still requires a launch and recovery system. They want to be able to go operate very tactically, go be able to, to load everything in a tactical vehicle, not trail a launch and recovery system, go operate for a day very covertly and pack everything up and come back. That's where a vertical takeoff and lift capability provides you that small footprint that enables special operations units to go, say, outside the wire very covertly and operate and, and not have to have any improved surface literally out of a out of a chimney or out of a hole um, and uh, and that's what we've done with this aircraft and still maintained the payload capacity and still maintained what we feel is is critical in the operational environment which is to support a 24-hour mission with two aircraft let me take you to the commercial marketplace a lot of growth um, FAA lifted a lot of the restrictions on it and this whole notion of sort of expanding the commercial utility of unmanned aircraft you guys have been a leader of it you know when it was in the the, the classified world uh, also you know over the past 15 20 years uh, 30 years 40 years almost in your guys case with with someone you know bordering on um, what are you guys interested at all in the commercial space and what are sort of partnerships? And, uh, you know, or, or are you considering even adopting some purely commercial aircraft in order to adapt it for military? Talk to us about the cycle you're trying to get to, you know, both into cracking the commercial world but then also capitalizing off of commercial development. That's an excellent question. There's much that we're doing in the unmanned space that is leverageable for commercial. It's tricky in these size aircraft. You know, the FAA has, has a lot of their rules for, 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 for the right reasons and it's moving into the right place, but there's still you know, the, the capability of these aircraft, the 80 nautical mile range or, or even satellite communications, that's not where the FAA is right now in these size aircraft. We do have operated for the, the uh, Department of the Interior in, in certain uh, um, um, certificates of authorization that we're able to get to fly over forest fires. We've done work uh, um, with the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership, uh, the FAA approved test site that we work with down at our schoolhouse in Virginia. Every day we fly in the national airspace. So there's, there, I think it's the, the markets and the space is coming around to our products. In the meantime, as you brought up, we are leveraging Cessna and we're doing manned ISR uh, with pods and with sensors that fly in both of these systems you see here. So getting the experience with the sensors, primarily getting the experience on how to package that data for use in the civil area, in the commercial area. How do they use the data? What kind of data do they want for precision agriculture, for forest fires, for oil and gas security? Getting the data using uh, Cessna 172, for instance, and then when the when the airspace clears up that enables us to fly these systems, we'll just be able to put those payloads in these systems. Dave, thanks very, very much. Really enjoyed it. And this interview would be a lot longer if it wasn't about 200 well, degrees here. Yes, thank you. It is, it is, it is cold, as you say, out yeah, here. Yeah, it's, it's positively <laughs> frosty, especially in a wool suit. Thanks very much again. Thank Best you. of luck at the air show. Okay, thanks.